good morning. Welcome to the National Indigenous Agriculture and Food Sharing Circle hosted by the Canadian Agricultural Human Resources Council. I'm going to be your host for this session. My name is Beverly O'Neill and my traditional name um, is the I'm from the Tanaka Nation, and I'm gratefully located in the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people in downtown Vancouver. So before we get started in this session, I want to in invite you all in the listening audience to add your name, let us know who you are and where you're from, add it into the chat, and, and, uh, and let us know who we've got listening from across the country. This session is recorded, so if there's information you want to return to Canadian Agricultural Human Resources Council will have the session posted online probably within about a week after this session. If you attended or missed the other sessions that we did prior to this one, we are uh, they are also now posted on Canadian Agricultural Human Resources Council website. Uh, when Aaron gets a moment, he's going to add that into the chat. And we cover things like our first session was on soil. So if you want to know um, uh, how to create your own soil. There's the first session on there with Sunny from, from the North. We also had the second session was with Dawn Metagongwa and she talked about preserving traditional ways of, of storing corn. The third session was on, oh, I'm uh, greenhousing. So we had we had greenhousing with Trevor Camp Thorne talking about how to build a greenhouse and just some some considerations in 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 the types of materials you would use to build one, and I um, unfortunately I forgot what our last session was. Our last session was on food labeling and food packaging, and in that session you learned uh, where you go to to find out what you must include on your food label in a project in, in a food package and some other links as well, um, mm -hmm. some tips on food food labeling. So many of you listening to the sessions are probably into processing jams and jellies and other food products itself. So uh, that's a good session to drop in, into. And it also leads really well into our session today, which, which is on apiary, um, more commonly known as beekeeping. So I'm gonna introduce our guests here in a, in a moment, but first of all, a couple of things. Um, in this session, we are targeted to finish at the top of the hour. So if you would like a chance to win our cash draw at the end, you must be present to win. So uh, what we'll do is we'll have our host introduce themselves, then we'll get into our presentation with Lorna. She's got um, a, a, a co-speaker with her, Kent Miller, who's also from, from Merrick. Kent, give everybody a wave. Lorna, give everybody a wave. Thanks. Lorna and Kent are from the Nicola Valley, Merritt itself, uh, just about an hour south of Kamloops, unless you drive really fast, then it's about 40 minutes. And so about two and a half hours from Vancouver on the Coquihalla Highway. Um, Lorna is is uh, does a lot of things at the Lower Nicola Indian Band. Um, one of them is she manages the Chalouse Gardens and, and Greenhousing, but we're here today to listen to uh, their beekeeping that she does. And Kent is with the Beekeeper Society in the Nicola Valley, and, and they're going to also explain how they work together and the importance of working with other beekeepers in the area. Uh, then if during the session you have any questions you would like to ask, uh, please put them in the Q&A feature. It is just right next to your chat feature in that session, in that Lorna and Kent and I will monitor your questions and then they may answer them during the session, but mostly right after they finish presenting, feel free to add questions in and we'll go through it. Then I'll also have a couple of questions to do it. And after the session, Aaron, and Aaron is a person you have been communicating with online, but he's the most important person in the session. He's the one that also organizes the draw at the end. So Aaron is on there. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jennifer Wright. She's the acting CEO of the Canadian Agriculture Human Resources Council. So Jennifer. Thanks so much, Beverly. And I just wanted to give a few words of welcome to everyone today. Uh, thank you to our presenters for sharing your time and sharing your knowledge and expertise. Um, for those of you not aware of our organization, we're a national nonprofit organization and uh, our work or our focus is on um, supporting agriculture and um, 
human resource needs, workforce needs um, for the industry across Canada. And we have been uh, working closely with Indigenous producers, um, providing things like the sharing circles to help support uh, Indigenous agriculture production as well. So really looking forward to the conversation today and very thankful for the time and expertise being shared here as well. Excellent. Thanks, Jennifer. And a couple shout outs to thanks, Jamie Draves from Georgetown, Ontario, for joining us. We also have um, Mackenzie Blanchard from mainland Nova Scotia, from Micmac, uh, Derek Mickelson from Winnipeg. Uh, um, Hi, it's Leslie. The, um, welcome from Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada to Winnipeg. And as I mentioned, please, please add your name into the chat so we know who you are and where you're coming from. So always good to know who we've got across this country. So thank you. Um, Jay, Aaron has also added to the chat the links to the Canadian Agriculture website where you can see the other videos from the past sessions. So I'm going to now turn it over to Lorna Shooter and to Kent Miller, who's going to be doing the presentation. So they'll just let me know during the session when to advance the next slide. So Lorna. Okay, good morning. My name is Lorna Shooter. I'm originally from Mount Curry Band uh, up in the Stavimok territory. I reside with the Lorna Indian Band and in the Kapmok territory. Um, I, I've just been a beekeeper. I'm a beginner beekeeper. I've only been started a couple of years ago. I've taken a few courses, which is really important, and uh, to be able to be a beekeeper. It's a lot of knowledge, and it takes many years to become a beekeeper. So I'm still in the practice mode. And um, I'd like to share with you information about um, how how could you become a beekeeper. And so. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to start with uh, slide one, please. Um, here in British Columbia, we have uh, an association called BC Honey Producers Association. Um, they have a, a, a kind of a saying that says uh, that they promote and encourage beekeeping in BC, and they've been doing that since 1920. Um, they have um, becoming a the BC Honey Producers Association also is also a proud member of the Canadian Honey Council, which if anyone wants to be a beekeeper, um, check out the Canadian Honey Council website or contact them and I have a slide for them for that information later on in the presentation. Uh, benefits of being a beekeeper and a member of this association, as you can see, you can um, get the BC magazine as well as the uh, the other magazine called Hive Lights. Um, so there's also uh, BCHP. A also has a library that you can tap into. And I think that in any of the provinces across Canada, there's, a, there's an association that you can sign up with to get more information. And you can also tap into their library. You can participate at workshops or conventions and uh, their AGMs. Usually they have AGMs with uh, guest speakers who are, are renowned beekeepers they are very, very knowledgeable. And also you, cut, you get an insurance package with this type of membership to the association. The association um, includes, uh, um, they want to know where your, where your hives are located so that they can, um, um, know if there's a, a outbreak of a disease for the broods or if there's a it might infestations that we need to uh, share and and uh, be knowledgeable about so uh, it's a good it's a good association to belong to second slide um lorenzo langstraw is is the found the father of modern beekeeping um he's he's a he was a member of he was a monk uh, in his day, and he uh, studied bees and beehives, so bee behavior. He is the uh, father of modern beekeeping, where he invented the um, and designed the long straw um, honey, the, the beehive um, design with the ten frames in it, and he included a, a very important part called a bee space which is about a three eighths of an inch or three sixteenths of an inch where the bees need that time, that small of a space in order for them to go in and out and move around inside their hive. 
Next slide, please. Um, getting started in bees. There's a bee act in British Columbia. Um, it's, it's also known as the Apiary Act. Um, it really should, and we really should be registered with this, with this Apiary site. Um, it permits, uh, you can get permits to sell your bees and your equipment through this bee act. And um, they also uh, talk about the, give more information about disease inspection and control. Um, let's see, I have a whole lot of notes here about it. Um, hey, Lorna. Yes. You have to have a permit to sell your bees and equipment from the provincial government in BC so that they're guaranteed disease free. Yes, very important. Okay. So if somebody buys equipment that doesn't have a, a permit, you're taking your livelihood into your own hands. Okay. Yes, that's why that's why you have to have permits and be registered. Um, it's very important to to uh, know about the diseases, so we we don't want to spread them um, from the it's viral. Free. Yeah, it's all free, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? No. <laughs> okay. So, would you like? Next slide, please. So through the BC Act, the Apiary Act in BC, we get people like um, this man here. He's a bee inspector and he's out at, at a site somewhere. What is his name? Uh, this is Lance Cuthrell. He's yeah. actually retired now, but he was the bee inspector in the uh, Castlegar region, I believe it was, up mm -hmm. in that area. So. Uh, but there's inspectors throughout BC, and yeah. if if you need an inspector to check out equipment, it's still a free inspection. Yes, that's right. That's part of our membership in being registered. Yep. Okay. Next slide, please. So you want to be a beekeeper? <laughs> well, the things you need to consider is is your attire. So we do have things like bee suits and, and uh, the veils on top. We do have, uh, highly recommend you wear gloves. I like wearing the gloves with the long sleeve because, um, and at the bottom, the, there's a, um, your bottom of your pants is either tied with elastic or string or tucked into your socks because the bees, they, they get around, they climb up you and down you and all around you. And um, they're out there to, uh, um, protect their hives. So this is just a look of some kind of part of the tools that we have and what it looks like when you lift the top lid, lots of bees in there. And um, so what I was doing there was I was checking for mites, I was checking for uh, diseases. Um, and then when I get inside, I would check for the queen or the brood, see if there is brood. And then if, if, if you can find it, the queen, it's always good to see that she's in good health and such. I also look for the food stores that are in the in the comb and uh, take care of things accordingly. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Getting started in bees, in, in beekeeping. Um, things that we want to consider is the location of where you want to put your hives and you want to be sure that there's water there and also food sources for the bees. Um, the bees like collecting pollen and nectar from plants and and there are a list of plants and a lot of research has been done on what kind of plants actually provide those foods for the, for the, for the bees and the propolis. Uh, next slide. Mm -hmm. So here's a whole hive location idea. This one is the one that we have at Chaloose Gardens where I work. Um, we, we, we can have up to 10 or 20 hives in there, but um, what we did was because we're in the mountain valley here, the Nicola Valley is a mountainous territory and where we are located, it, the wind comes from all the different directions. And so we, we decided to put up a, a big bee fence like this. However, that's rather extravagant because really they, all they really need is an electric fence around them. But because it's so cold and windy right from the top of those snow mountains up there, uh, we thought we would kind of make a microclimate for them. So we have the bees sitting off the ground, not 
we don't want the bottom box sitting on the ground, but we just have it a little bit like sitting on a pallet. Underneath that, we have a, a drop sheet just to help with the maintenance of weeds, a weed control. Otherwise, you're pulling the weeds away from the entrance of the hives and stuff. We also want to make sure that they have um, the plants and such that they need for their food sources. We also need to have water source. And so we, we put a drip line in there and, the bee, and a little tray for them to go and to drink from so they don't have to use so much energy to fly to their water sources. Uh, and um, there was a suggestion that perhaps we could put the bee entrance facing sunrise so that it'll warm up and then they would be able to get out and do their foraging as early as the sun will allow them to. Um, they, they need to be in a, a they don't operate very well in the cold so that's why you won't see them out when it's raining or cold at night and stuff they go back in and so next slide please um we suggest that you provide hives access to water and plants that provide pollen nectar and propolis so at our garden we've actually put plants that have those of the pollen and or nectar right in pots close to them and surrounded to them. And uh, then we planted out and about and around throughout the whole garden in the fields. We're always thinking about what kind of plants do we need to put out there for the, for the bees and we supply that. And then we've had such great crops because of their pollination skills, you know, uh, it's just amazing how much, how much produce we can get. Then by providing all that, then they in turn make a lot of honey for us. So it's a pretty good partnership. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, getting started in bees. We need bees, we need equipment, and you need to know the cost. So um, here's another bee yard that's been surrounded with an uh, electric fence. You can see the post, but you, the wires, you can't see them. But it also helps a lot to keep the bears away. And uh, but I think at least bears because they can really devastate your just totally destroy your hives. Um, next slide, please. Here's a picture of uh, from 1545, one of the earliest pictures of a bee dress from Sebastian Munster's. Um, notice how they have gowns and they have a, a veil on the top. And um, and the hives that they're operating are called skep, the, the hive skeps, and they have a handle on the top, and it's a very old way of keeping bees. Um, I'm told that in some places in Africa they still use these. Are they called skeeps? Um, they catch the people would catch swarms and they put them inside these skeeps, and then they would just. Uh, raise their bees until they and then they mash them to get their honey out of there. So um, long straw hive system is a lot better because then you can utilize the, the single frames that are in the box and you don't have to break things. You can, it, and you don't have to disturb the bees either. So that's a really important factor there. Next slide, please. Yeah, here's a little list of um, startup costs. And these prices I think are um, outdated now but um, I highly recommend that you check your local bee suppliers in your province and your territories for uh, updated prices, but it is going to cost something, um, a bit of money, you know, like a thousand dollars, it says down there, but maybe a bit higher. So these are just a, a, a kind of a list of things that you're going to need if you're going to work with bees, uh, suits and hats and veils and, and good Good working gloves. You could use leather gloves, make your own, as long as they're sealed so the bees don't get inside them. Um, you also want to have, they suggest, two colonies of bees. Um, that would be like two beehives. And there's all different types of tools, but some of them you can be tools that you have from your farm or whatever, but there are tools made specifically for beekeeping. And you'll want to have a smoker. A smoker, the smoke calms the bees down so that you can work, it makes them go back into their hive or stay away. They just calm right down. So, a smoker is an important tool. Honey supers are the boxes that the frames go into. 
we have to get the honey out of the frame. So we there's an extractor that you can see. They're called honey extractors. There's a whole bunch of different designs and styles that you can suppliers for the honey extractors. And the prices are um, pretty high right now. I'm looking for extractors myself. You can have manual extractors or motorized extractors of all different sizes. There's also a tool called an uncapping knife. Um, it's like an electric knife. It's, the electricity in the knife keeps it warm so that it just kind of glides across the top of the hive. And other dish, uh, dis, medicinal uh, miscellaneous stuff like medications and mite controls and stuff. But like I said, you got to check your bee suppliers for um, updated uh, prices. And there is a lot more, but anyways, next slide, please. <laughs> so honey harvesting and feeding. Honey frames in the bins with, the, in this one here, I've got, I'm working on the bees. You can see that uh, my gloves my in my suit, but um, the, there's a top lid that my hand is on right there. Um, over in the bin, I have fra honey frames in there already. And uh, I've been taking, either I'm taking I'm harvesting honey right now so um, I put them in these bins but you really got to make sure to brush your bees off your frames before you put them in your bin because I've done the I've done it before when I wasn't so careful and we had bees galore inside our shop where we're trying to extract so I highly recommend you try to get as many bees away as you can and um, I was giving them white sugar there's a bag of white sugar in the background that was just a it was a spring harvest, so obviously I was putting sugar and feeding the bees um, just to help them uh, get out before the cover. Because it looks like there wasn't very many plants growing at the time, too, so we have to take care of our feeding our bees in the spring. And we'll also take care of it with uh, both the bottom and the top entrance. We use, we use sugar syrup, which is made with white sugar and water. Um, I think it's uh, two, two parts of sugar to one part of water. It Mix it in a syrup form and pour it into bladders of some sort. And then add that. A bladder can be the size of a frame. It just fits right inside the, the brood boxes. Brood boxes being where the queen lays her eggs and then they're called brood. And then we'll add white sugar to it. And there's nutrition. We also add um, uh, nutritional and medical pollen patties in the spring for extra bee food spring and fall. Okay, next slide, please. Um, getting started in bees, economical opportunities include. Uh, now these prices here, I have a plus sign that, that behind each number because the, these prices are a bit outdated, but it can give you an idea of the economical value of beekeeping. Um, we can sell honey you can sell the honey. There's a good market for that. You can sell the wax also. And pollination per colony. They, that means that um, you can rent your, your colonies, your beehives out to ranchers, farmers, whoever, to pollinate crops of uh, alfalfa or other crops, of orchards and berry crops and you name it. But you can people will rent your hives to go out there and pollinate their big, huge crops. There's also money made in the pollen collecting, which is uh, additional equipment that you require. Um, there's royal jelly. The, queen, the bees make a royal jelly that people, that there's a market for that. And for the venom, which is good for medicine, uh, queen production where beekeepers will raise queen and then sell them to other beekeepers. As you'll notice, a little package of queens, and also packages of nukes. A nuke is um, is about three or four frames of of bees, of mature worker bees. And so when I when I want to uh, start a new hive, I would buy a a, a a nuke pack per hive or per box, and I would buy a queen. And so that costed me about two hundred and fifty bucks for those two things nowadays. But um, um, again, you have to go to a reliable source probably, or you could raise your own queens and your own nukes as well and split your hides and different things. 
but there's also a market for propolis, which is collected from the evergreen trees. The bees use propolis for, um, for patching up their hive and repairing things in their hive, wrapping, you know, like all kinds of things. So just to give you an idea of economic opportunities in the beekeeping industry. Next page, please. Um, Chaloose Garden, here's an idea of, of what we do at Chaloose Gardens is, we call it Chaloose Garden Honey. And um, so we, after we harvest it and extract it out of our machines, we can restrain it and then it goes into containers for the marketplace. And so that's just an idea of what we do. Then we added a label. But I wanted to also let you know that here in the Nicola Valley, because um, there's a, a, quite a few beekeepers here, small ones like me or larger ones, more experienced like Kent and Grimshires and, and uh, Nicola Valley Honey and stuff. But we decided we should have a bee club of our own. So we, we went through the process with the BC Honey Producers Program Association. And they said, yep, you guys qualified. So we started up our own bee club here. Um, otherwise, there's bee clubs like in the Thompson Nicola, uh, the Thompson Valley, which is Kamloops area, and there's beekeeper clubs down in the Fraser Valley and elsewhere. Just to give you an idea, uh, if you want to be a beekeeper, you can have a club. That's where your other beekeeping, uh, um, the other beekeepers in the valley or within the province can actually meet and talk and just talk about and learn from each other share knowledge i highly recommend it. it's really awesome i really love it next slide please <laughs> where do i find it well bees they're local beekeepers or distributors in each province across canada around the world probably there's equipment um in for example, we uh, go to the Bee Maid, uh, Alberta Honey Producers Co-op in the Spruce Grove, Alberta. They have their phone number there for you. And, um, and you can get medications, um, Medivet in High River, and there's their phone number. These are simply guidelines. These are places that are, that are, are um, well-established uh, places that you can get bee supplies from. And for information, you can go to your provincial apiarist, and there's a 800 number there. Apiculture website, we've included that, so you could go onto that site and check it out, do your research before you get it, investing a whole lot of money in your beekeeping. Start small, I'd say, and, and let it grow. And yourself, you're not, you're not evolving with knowledge, and then you just expand accordingly. And there's an information basket also with the BC government of Canada, but you'll find other places, um, other other research places uh, for each province in Canada. Next slide, please. Here I had a slide of, of a beehive because um, these are really old slides and they're painted. You can paint your boxes however you like, but the bees will recognize their hive according to a color or symbol that you would like to know about the colors that they can see and that they can't see. So there's some research for you to think about. And here we've got um, marigolds over there and the water, a drip line going to it just to help the bees out some. But did you notice that the lid is tipped? Uh, that, that top lid is tipped and it's to expose the top bee entrance and to allow air circulation. So there's an arrow there because the bee entrance is just underneath that uh, slanted roof of the slanted box. There's also an entrance down at the bottom box too for them to go in and out of, but they need two entrances, just so you know. You think Kent, anything? Oh, no, it's okay. Next slide, please. <laughs> so here's a little talk about um, the flowers and the food that the bees require. I know um, in the books here, it says that, like, and depending on which province you're in, what climate you have, but there's a whole bunch of plants that the bees will like to go to. Um, one of the earlier ones in BC here would be the willow tree. Um, the willow starts to uh, starts starts with um, giving off pollen and nectar like May 10th here in BC. 
to about June 10th. And the dandelions, people think they're a weed, but actually they're really important for the pollinators, for the bee, for the honeybees, because they they come out at about May 27th, around BC here till June 17th or so. And they they're one of the those are the uh, some of the few plants that the bees are start feeding and collecting their pollen and nectar from. And there's a whole list of plants that you could research and find out what you need to work, like for locating your bees. So we've got a picture of a bee here, a um, little bee on their dandelion. That would be around May 27th. So keep your dandelions growing for the bees. Next slide. we got things like the, like the, what is that, a dandelion? Oh no, that's a poppy. So those are good plants to have in your garden or in your fields around the hives. Next slide, please. Peonies and poppies, they look similar. Another one. Next slide. Sunflowers. Sunflowers are also like a later, uh, in the, it's more like late summer to fall and winter. The bees will, um, if you could plant lots of sunflowers someplace, they will just have food all the time. At Chalus Gardens, we have rows and rows and rows of sunflowers because we use them for shade and we use them for for food for the bees. And they are also used for windbreak because it's so windy there. But um, because of that, we have so many bees there and, and insects that like to pollinate because there's other kinds of pollinators. It's really important to have pollinators when you're growing crops. I think that's pretty cool. Next slide, please. <laughs> So this is my last slide, but I wanted to share it with you because um, it'll tell about uh, the Canadian Honey Council, who is a really important um, BC Honey Producers Association is a proud member of this um, Canadian Honey Council. Then there's the Canadian beekeepers and the Canadian honey packers. Um, they're all really important for uh, beginners, uh, everybody to know who's into beekeeping. I have the information right below it, um, the Canadian Honey Council, CHC it's called. It's a, is a national organization of the Canadian beekeeping industry. And they have a magazine called Hive Lights, which is the industry's magazine. And it's a really good magazine. It has ads about suppliers. It has stories about, from each of the different um, provincial um, beekeepers. This is a magazine here. So uh, inside there, there's a whole list of the provincial associations that you may be wanting to get in touch with if you're going to get into beekeeping or you require more information for whatever reason. So, uh, so let's see. With that, I'll uh, open the floor for questions. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you, Lorna. This is fantastic stuff. Um, I, we, this is, as Lorna mentioned, this is an opportunity for you in the listening audience to ask any questions that you like. But while you're thinking of questions or typing them in, um, I, I, I feel I've got a couple of questions to ask, but I've got to start off with bees like to smoke. <laughs> It has the same calming effect on bees as it does on human smokers? <laughs> no. Smoke actually uh, is one of the few dangers that bees face. Okay. And if you smoke a, a hive with a little bit of smoke, they think that there could be a grass fire or a forest fire coming that mm -hmm. could burn their house down. So their immediate reaction is get ready to move quickly. Ah. So they go in and gorge themselves on honey and it's much like after a big turkey dinner at Christmas. Do you really feel like going out and running a marathon? No. <laughs> <laughs> so smoking has a, so smoking turns bees into overstuffed turkey people bees. That's right. It's more like it's more like you at Christmas time after you've eaten too much turkey, you want a nice Chesterfield to lay down and relax on, right? <laughs> so so the key thing is be very careful on how much you um you you smoke your bees because it said it must sadly you guys must have been really uh, the bees must have been hurt greatly during the fires a couple years ago. So 
So good to see there are a number of bees that survived. Um, just a, a comment here. The University of Manitoba offers a short course on beekeeping for the hobbyist and the person. And I, and he also says that they think it's also available remotely. So um, workshops, courses, any suggestions on those? Because uh, it's not just, a, I'm sure it's not just a matter of buying two hives and, uh, and a queen and some nukes. And it, there's a lot more to getting started than that. If you want to get started in beekeeping, the yes. best way to do it is the way Lorna and a number of other people have done. Um, I took a certified instructor course a number of years ago, and I offer a beekeeping beginner's course, mm -hmm. but it's a hands-on course. Okay. And uh, you can find them pretty well everywhere in Canada, the same thing. If you can get a hands-on course, take it. Mm -hmm. There is a number of universities that offer advanced courses, but you have to have been keeping bees for, uh, depending on the course you're taking, some places three years, some places five years before you're even allowed to take the course. Mm. Okay. Uh, there's a bee masters one in BC, which requires you to either be a commercial beekeeper already or have a minimum of five years experience beekeeping. Mm. Okay. There is Coatlin College in BC that offers a commercial beekeepers commercial beekeeper course. It's a one year course. Uh, if you've been keeping bees and working for a commercial beekeeper, you're allowed in after three years. <laughs> Otherwise, it's five years before you're allowed in to take the course. And the idea is, is that when you start taking the course, when you finish the course, you will be a commercial beekeeper because mm -hmm. they teach you not just the beekeeping, but also all the financial end of it as to how you work the finances in order to run your business. Okay. It's a very comprehensive type of course and it's an excellent thing to do. Uh, mm -hmm. I know they offer the same thing in Ontario. Yeah. Same it's for excellent. similar ideas. Excellent. So to get started, to start with a hands-on, hands-on course working with someone like you, Kent, that that shows you the ropes. You know, Lorna, I imagine you, you, you um, it's it's stuff that you would also also know. But hands-on is the first is the first start because before you can start to take some of some of the more technical university commercial stuff, you have to have it anywhere yeah. from three to five years under your belt. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. So likely there's more. So we've mentioned BC and we've mentioned Ontario. Um, we've got a question here from Jamie Draves. Jamie asks, what's the greatest challenge to beekeeping? Oh, well, um, I think weather is one of them. The environmental mm. factors is a, is a great challenge. We're mm. always trying to figure out what's the weather going to be like? What do we need to do for the bees? And um, to me, that would be it. Uh, another one would be uh, um, actually being able to get out there and work on the bees all the time. It, it takes a lot of back work, I think, because when the hives are full of brood and honey and, and such, they can be quite heavy. So um, to me, you have to be physically fit in order to take care of those hives. Yeah. The other, the other big challenge now is finding people who are, it's got to be done very quickly be able to turn around and stop and beekeeping is not something you do in a hurry in a big rush uh you can do it quickly once you know what you're doing but to start with the biggest thing is slow down and learn and do it very slowly and very methodically and it's very hard to teach people that are you know used to the instant fix of uh, I can get that answer on the computer in three, you know, three seconds uh, to turn around and find out that no, it's going to take them 30 minutes to find that answer out when they're looking through a hive. Time. <laughs> so it's really, it's an exercise in patience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, Lorna, we talked about a few a few things before when we we're prepping for this. Um, talk about your relationship in in Mara. You, you mentioned your club, so uh, you, you said you know you love to share ideas. But let's talk about how you work together and the importance of of uh, connecting with other beekeepers in your area. Okay, yeah. So Kent and I were were chatting about one day. We were chatting about mm -hmm. um, in the spring, I think it was that uh, we need to 
you know, like we could have gone to Kamloops or the Fraser Valley or somewhere to, to travel great distances to get to um, uh, workshops and meetings, uh, like a, just a beekeeper meeting somewhere else. But mm -hmm. I thought, well, why don't we just start one here in the Nicola Valley? I'm sure we have enough beekeepers. And for me, I don't have a whole lot of time to be traveling off and doing stuff. So, um, so we started, so Kent and, um, and, his, and his wife, Ellen, went into um, the, B, the BC Honey Producers Association to inquire what is it that we need to start our own bee club. And um, they said, well, as long as you have enough uh, registered beekeepers there, you'll, you'll, you can qualify. And then the trick is to keep everybody together and to keep the club going all the time. So we have to, so we're, we're, we've been meeting, but we started this club too, just before COVID hit. So it really put a lull on us. But we still kept in communication, um, going to help each other with whatever be keeping they're doing at the time. If, if one of us needs help or somebody gets sick or someone's away, but the bees still have to be fed, they still have to be watered. They, uh, you know, it's really good to have a, a camaraderie and to have um, uh, like-minded people that can give you a helping hand um, wherever possible. And sometimes, um, and also the knowledge that we each share, we all have different ways of, of taking care of our hives or doing our, doing our own beekeeping somehow. So it's always good to share those ideas with each other because perhaps there's a way to save a few bucks also um, to make use of that farm equipment that we have around or the wood or the tools or different techniques for collecting the hives or taking care of the bees or winterizing the bees or mixing the if you have to make your own patties and stuff, it's always so good to have expert um, other people uh, with their expert ideas. And uh, then we just help each other. Or sometimes we don't have enough food or patties and, and the suppliers don't have any more food or or maybe there's a sugar shortage or something or other, or the, the, the smokers or the jars, you can't get in touch with them. So by having a, a camaraderie, a, a beat club, um, we can collect those things and make sure that we have enough for our valley. And and Kent, what do you think? Do you have suggestions? Uh, the big one is that uh, the BC now has a tech transfer program. So you get, um, you can get updates from all kinds of, uh, a lot of different programs that are going on throughout uh, not just BC, even in Canada, on um, might um, new pesticides, also control methods and stuff like that. And uh, a number of the universities across Canada are doing various research on uh, on a number of different items. And so all of these things are all uploaded into this tech transfer program, which seems to be working quite well. So that's kind of a a new thing that they've they've got going here in just in the last year, mm -hmm. and the government has funded it quite nicely for uh, the first three years. They've promised funding, and then after that, it'll be an ongoing thing. So uh, they've really mm -hmm. given the beekeeping industry a big leg up on new uh, all kinds of new things that are coming out. Um, UBC has a whole lab where they do just um, like gene, um, they've been studying uh, bee genes for uh, almost yeah. 10 years now. And uh, it used to be at SFU, but now it's, it's pretty much all moved over to uh, UBC under Leonard Foster in BC. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, a number of other organizations across Canada. There's Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, you know, Ontario, all across Canada, there's, you know, similar things, but everybody seems to pick a little different uh, research projects. So eventually, hopefully they'll have much like the human where they're, you know, trying gene therapy for all kinds of stuff. Well, maybe they'll get gene therapy for bees so that we won't have problems with disease the same, which would be yeah. kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah, you know? there you go. So I, you guys talked about um, different economies 
in the industry, and one of them was with with Queens itself. So, um, you know, one of the things I became quite interested in beekeeping on was when I was in Australia, was in New Zealand, and they have a huge burgeoning industry that uh, I, I think I bought one of the cheapest jars of of honey, and it was thirty dollars. And um, typically at that time when I was there about six years ago, a jar of honey could easily be $100, $200 because of the market. But the, the bee, the honey, the queens itself, they they have a sector in their industry on selling of queens. Um, if you were to buy a queen, do you need to be concerned with geography? Like if it came from a different region, how, you know, I, I understand with with uh, with certain livestock, you have to be aware that certain livestock can only thrive in certain conditions. Is that something we should be concerned with if we're starting our own beehives? Uh, bees get acclimatized to where they live, much <laughs> like people or anybody else, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, bees that are bought locally, and when I mean locally, I mean anywhere locally yeah. uh, to wherever you happen to live will do better in your area than queens that are imported from anywhere. So okay. preferences to buy a localized bee. If you can get local bees, the big thing is depending on the time of year, you may not be able to get local queens. Mm. Okay. So uh, in many parts of Canada, you can't produce queens early in the spring. So uh, it's you know, fairly late in the summer by the time you can get new queens, mm -hmm. which is great. But if you need queens early in the spring, the only place you can get those generally is imports. So mm -hmm. Canada imports in the hundreds of thousands of queens from places like Chile, Australia, New Zealand, even uh, Hawaii, mm -hmm. okay, where they can make queens up in, our, in the middle of our winter, they can make queens up for us. And so uh, package bees and queens are a big import thing first thing in the spring to replace hives that didn't make it through the winter in Canada. So, so importing is importing um, the the queen and the nooks is 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 an industry and is something to consider, but the preference is always to buy a local is to get yeah. local. Okay. Yeah. You can't in, you can't in Import nukes. You can only import packages. Packages is bees only, no brood or comb or anything. Okay. 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 Oh, cool. Cool. Okay. Learning a lot. At, learning a lot about bees. Um, hey, we've got a couple of questions before we we wrap up here. How do you manage to not? Uh, how do you manage not growing the apiary too quickly? So it sounds like pace and growth is really important in in this industry. Uh, that's part of your learning curve in the first five years. Is how not to end up as uh, the big joke is that uh, the guy started out the first year with two hives and then by the third year he had a dozen because he caught all his swarms. The trick is you don't want to be able to have to do that. If you did it right, you started out with two the first year and you only increased to three or four the second year because you wanted to, not because you had to. Mm. So, um, if you can learn how to do that, you've got an awful lot of your beekeeping figured out. But I've been keeping bees for years and years. And the big thing that I've learned is that I don't know a whole lot about bees. <laughs> <laughs> the older, yeah, you wish you were 20, or 20 years old again when you knew everything? That's about <laughs> it, you know. Uh, the older I get, the less I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, if you ask any beekeeper that's been doing it for years, you'll find that they say, you know, like they're they're still learning. I don't care how many years I've been keeping bees, you're still learning. Yeah, yeah. So keep an open keep, keep an open mind. Couple of questions yeah. here. What can you think of as the most cutting edge thing going on in the beekeeping industry? And and are you aware of any successful beekeepers north of fifty six in the far in the north? Cutting there edge is. and and in the north uh there are some people in the yukon mm. i do cool. know that um i can't remember his name uh if you went on to the uh if you went on to the last agm for the for the bchpa uh his talk would be on there okay excellent but he's from um up in the yukon and he's been successfully keeping bees there for about the last seven or eight years 
Excellent. Great. So, so check that, check that out. I imagine um, once you connect with one person in the Yukon that um, they're pretty close knit community, I would, I would guess and be keeping. So uh, any yeah. suggestions on what do you see as the most cutting edge thing going on in the industry? Well, part of that is the tech transfer that they have. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Leonard Foster's genome system, you know, like he's been mapping the whole genome system for uh, bees. Mm -hmm. uh, Saskatchewan has got a whole um, breeding program that they've been going on for a number of years now. They don't import bees at all. Mm -hmm. They produce all of their own. Now they're exporting queens from Saskatchewan to other provinces. Um, Ontario, uh, Guelph in Ontario has some, some pretty cutting edge technology uh, programs going on there as well. But the, uh, the tech transfer program that they've brought in in BC now kind of ties you in with all those. If you're uh, uh, wanting to get into all that and find out that information, all you have to do then is go into the the tech transfer program or go into the, the various sites from the uh, whatever you're looking for. So it, it's kind of nice to be able to do that. So it sounds uh, like connecting, staying connected with your universities, your industry, your government sectors, not only for to see if there's technology programs or beekeeping support out there, but find out what the current research is. Yep. Yeah, yeah, there's uh, and there's there's new research going on because miticides only work for so long, the, mm. the mites become resistant to it. So there's new research on new miticides. They've been trying a variety of other uh, ideas. A uh, number of years back, there was, um, um, it's a, a, basically it's a mushroom that mm. attacks insects, that um, parasitizes insects. And they were trying to figure out if they could get some way that they could manage to modify some of that. This is a, a U.S. project. Um, mm. If they can ever get that to work, it would solve all the problems with mites. So bees on mushrooms? No, nope. no. Nope. <laughs> it's a, it's uh it's a just they would just use a spray, uh, yeah. like a mushroom. Okay. Spray to. to so mushrooms on bees. Mushrooms yes. on bees, yes. <laughs> but it's one of those things that, you know, like it's, it, it's sometimes they have great results, you know. Yeah. They have a 100% success rate. It killed all the mites, but it also killed all the bees. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's, that's not successful <laughs> if it's killing your bees. Speaking of yeah. bees and bees and other plants, as talking to Lorna, we see some honey packaged that says, you know, made from honeysuckle or made from blueberry, blueberries, and it does have different flavors. So how do you get your bees to only go to certain plants or do you? Like, um, like, yeah, no, that's not your plant. Go to another one. Uh, bees go to wherever the best honey source is. Mm -hmm. So the trick is, is to put them somewhere. Um, if you can go, there are huge blueberry fields. There are huge mm -hmm. raspberry fields. And, and um, the blueberry growers, the cranberry growers, apple growers, they'll all rent bees to pollinate their crops. Mm. So canola in Alberta and the, on the prairies is huge. Um, sunflowers are another mm. huge one that people actually get uh, their, their bees into sunflowers. Alfalfa. Yeah. They're pretty much a big mono crop. If you drop your bees in the middle of it, the only thing that they're going to pick up is that. So you extract your honey or as soon as you take your bees out of there, you pull all your honey off and extract that honey. And you can pretty much have with about 95% certainty that crop of honey. Yeah. Um, depending on where you are in the world, uh, you get a lot of different mono uh, because bees stay with one type of flower yeah. until it's finished. Okay. Ah. 
So it's it's putting there them where the the food source is that you want to have that yeah. flavor from. It's, yeah. That's great, and I guess you start to talk about regional branding then as well. So that's yeah. that's pretty great. So, um, hey guys, this is where we're closing in on the top of the hour. I wanted to give you a chance to make any uh, final comments here, and and just a quick note to our listening audience, Derek. Mickelson has shared shared online the North of 60 Beekeeping um, website. So that's where you can find that. Lorna and Kent, any final comment? Lorna, we'll start with you and we'll go to Kent. Oh, well, I'm certainly happy that I we could with that we could pull this together and um, share our knowledge with other potential beekeepers and beekeepers, people that have already been involved in beekeeping. I really uh I, I started beekeeping because I wanted to po have pollinators for our crops. Mm. and whatnot and that's what started and then because i i forage in the forest i collect plant medicinal plants and make salves and i wanted the wax the wax because i had to buy wax to make, to make my salves and stuff and so that's the second reason why i got into bees <laughs> the third reason is because now i just totally love those little critters even though i've been stung a few times you know <laughs> no worries i'll know better next time so <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's I wish everybody that's the best, and I think I really I, I can't emphasize it how much more is um if you want to get into beekeeping, do your research, study it, get some education, uh, talk to other other beekeepers, the industry, go check it out, and then uh, slowly invest, start small and grow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorna. Uh, final word from you, Kent. Um, there's like Lorna said, it's it's kind of a quite a satisfying. Uh, opportunity when you're working with your bees. Uh, there's also a lot of business opportunities. So if people learn to keep bees, it takes a while to learn to keep bees, yeah. but there's uh, really good business opportunities in pollination and honey and queen production, new production all across Canada for a lot more beekeepers. Mm -hmm. There's, there's lots of area out there that are, uh, way underutilized. So, um, and honey prices are up quite a bit right now. So, if somebody wanted to get into the business, now is a good time to get into it. Excellent. Such such great comments and remark remarks there. And uh, you know, as Indigenous people too, it's the it gives an opportunity for us to gain stronger connections with our place and our land and and to connect with other industries because when you talked about about dandelions think of the fact that uh, dandelion too has a special place in first nations ethnobotany and, and culture itself so it really connects on that one and for that jan any final comments you'd like to make jan and phyllis uh, phyllis is is our contact with the indigenous advisory committee with canadian agriculture human resources council and as as I mentioned earlier, Jan is the CEO of Canadian Agricultural Human Resources Council. I'd just like to say thank you very much, Lorna and Kent, for sharing your uh, knowledge and your expertise in beekeeping. It was a very interesting conversation, gave me a lot to think about as well. And uh, the questions coming from the audience, I think, just showed uh, the engagement and the level of interest, which is really great. So thank you very much. And thank you, Beverly, for being our, uh, our host as well and uh, moving things along, which is always great. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. Phyllis? Um, I just want to thank everyone who's attended uh, these sessions. Again, our second set has been I think quite successful and from feedback we've received, um, you know, we've got uh, the wheels spinning on what the next ones are gonna look like. So do keep in touch and uh, do fill out those uh, post session surveys uh, because that's what makes a great next session set, set, set of sessions. So uh, thanks everyone for attending and uh, we'll be in touch in the new year with what's next. Okay, thank you. And of course, don't forget to fill out the post session survey. Let us know what your thoughts are, whether uh, thoughts are for our next series of sessions itself. We also have Trevor, who's who's uh, been a part of these sessions. He was a speaker in Greenhouse and anyone in British Columbia um, looking for additional knowledge on a wide range of things in the agriculture sector. I uh, held off saying field. 
because there's my pun for the day. Um, Trevor is is incredibly knowledgeable on many things, not just in greenhouse, but it's also primary contact with the First Nations Agriculture Association. Everybody, thank you again for joining us online here. Hope you've enjoyed the sessions. Again, they are posted on Canadian Agriculture Human Resources Council. Uh, Aaron will have this one up in probably about a week. Feel free to visit them and view them as much as you like and do share these links to others. I know there are people that didn't attend that have been watching them and we've been hearing from them. You guys, everyone have a happy holiday. I'm wishing you all good health and, and, and safe and safety. And we look forward to seeing you at our next sessions and please do connect with us. We look forward to um, working with you in the future. Thanks, Lorna. Thanks, Kent. Great to see everybody.